Thank you, Leah. Thank you for that poem as, as well as for your reflections and thank you. Sorry. In the 1950s, the Air Force designed a pilot seat that was based on the average physical dimensions of an adult male. Well, 4,000 pilots later, they found that not a single one of those pilots comfortably fit in that seat. Not a single one of the actual real life pilots had average dimensions. And so they went back to the drawing board and they designed an adjustable seat, one that could move and adjust to the pilot rather than the pilot adjusting to the seat. Something that now is just commonplace to, to all of us anytime we, we step into a car. Now, I didn't learn that story as a member of the Air Force um, or as a designer, or I didn't learn it in history class. Um, I learned about it in my prior life as an educator um, when I began to explore concepts of universal design and their application to education and learning, um, a concept that's called universal design for learning. Um, and it's a, an approach I became familiar with over multiple years of developing and leading an intentionally inclusive summer camp. Um, a summer camp that was designed to a philosophy that all children, all children can learn, all children can play, and all children can make friends, regardless of their abilities or disabilities, and that each child will approach those things differently. And they may need different types of supports or approaches in order to learn or to play or to make friends. And so we no longer designed camp for the average camper. We designed camp to pay attention to each and every child and family that came to camp, their individual differences, and each and every child's family and that family's differences. See, once upon a time, we did have a series of summer camps programs that were based on different age ranges, um, what year they were in school, a camp that was based on the average preschooler, the average first grader, the average second grader, and, and so on. And we realized that there were always some kids who were having an absolutely miserable time. Um, that they would sometimes act out, sometimes have difficulty connecting with their peers, um, that they were sometimes challenging for their camp counselors. And we discovered quite accidentally that some of these children had some form of what people call a hidden disability. They either had some form of, of um, disability that's not visibly apparent, uh, kids who had autism or some form of sensory processing challenge or some other form of what we, in, from the 1990s till now, have started to call neurodiversity. Um, kids with ADHD, uh, kids with some form of learning challenge or difference. And that often their parents or their caregivers didn't want to tell us about this prior to the start of camp because they were afraid their child would not be welcome or would not be allowed uh, to belong. So the first thing that we did was make it okay to talk about these things. Make it okay for the parents to talk about these things. Make it okay for the camp counselors to talk about these things. Make it okay for the kids themselves to share what they were experiencing and what kind of support they needed. And we created an intentionally inclusive camp program an initiative that we called Zoo Camp for All. And in that process created a sense of, of invitation. Thought about ways that we could create connections between people 
and with our camp families and did the work over time of creating a sense of belonging. And it wasn't easy. It didn't happen overnight. Um, it took time, and it took intention, and it took commitment. It meant letting go of a kind of one-size-fits-all approach and having a wide range of approaches, a wide range of experiences, having flexibility and willingness to adapt and to change, a willingness to have difficult conversations and an openness to trying new things, having a spirit of creativity and experimentation. It was fun. It was challenging. It was hard work, and it was good work. And it was heart work, heart work with a T. And if you ask me, it was spirit work and it was spiritual work. And for me, it feels like a natural progression to move from that to ministry. But the underlying core of all of it was really, really quite simple, that all kids can learn, all kids can play, all kids can make friends, and they'd each do this differently. And that we would find ways to honor and value and make space for those differences. Now, I believe that there's lessons in there for us when we think about how we create and practice church community and what it means to create and practice beloved community beyond our church walls. Can we create a space in which we feel like our full and whole selves are welcome and invited. Not only when we're new and coming through the door for the first time, but when we've been here for months or we've been here for years. How are we invited and welcomed again and again? How is that invitation renewed? What are the invitations we offer to one another? And what are the invitations that we offer to ourselves? Can we invite our own precious and fullest selves to be present? This month's Soul Matters uh, small group packet, if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, it so beautifully reminds us that this practice of invitation is a practice for ourselves and for others. And it's a gentle practice, one in which we hold ourselves and each other gently. If you haven't read it yet, I invite you to take a look at it soon, and it opens with this beautiful poem, Clearing, by Martha Postlewaite. And it goes, Do not try to save the world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently. Wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of being rescued. Create a clearing in the deep forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize it and you greet it. And only then will you know how to give to yourself, to this world so worthy of rescue. We hold the song of our life gently in our own cupped hands. Are we able to see and recognize what we each are holding? Can we invite others to see what is it that we are holding in our own hands? Oops, sorry. One moment. Are we able 
to make space to see the song that others hold in their hands. A song that may be vastly different than our own. And what is it that we need to do to recognize it? And what is it that we need to do to greet it? The religious educator and activist C.B. Bill Beale tells a story of an ice cream social party in which at this party there's two flavors available chocolate and vanilla and the people who come to this party who love chocolate love this party and the people who show up to this party that love vanilla love this party but the people who show up hoping for a different flavor are going isn't there a little more diversity here or some other choices? And the person who's hosting the party is like, yeah, yeah, we've got, we've got vanilla with flakes, with vanilla flakes. We've got vanilla bean. We've got French vanilla. We've got slow whipped vanilla. We've even got German chocolate. But for the people who are looking for more, a wider variety, who's favorite flavors of ice cream are different than chocolate or vanilla. Don't feel part of that party or don't feel like that party's for them. Now the person, see Bill goes on to say, now the person who is, uh, who created that party didn't set out that day thinking, oh, I'm gonna make sure that people don't feel welcome to my ice cream party. They woke up saying, I'm gonna throw this party and it's going to be great, and everybody's going to love it. And the person who threw it obviously loved chocolate and loved vanilla, and those were the things that was part of their experience. And he tells that story, and he says, and I agree, um, that sometimes we fall into the trap of approaching church that way that we sometimes feel that what feels purposeful and meaningful to each of us, that what connects to our own lives and our own experience is what feels purposeful and meaningful to everyone else. That what creates a sense of connection and belonging for us creates a sense of connection and belonging for everyone else. We can unintentionally approach creating church community like the Air Force designing a seat for the average pilot. But what C.B. Beale challenges us to think about instead is what they call preemptive radical inclusion, which is a way of saying, let's think about what it is that other people might need who are showing up that are different from us. What is it that they might want or need? and thinking about that in advance. Not necessarily waiting until they arrive, but thinking of it before, this practice of thinking about um, how people impacted by different forms of injustice or oppression or different life experiences will, what they might want or need. People who think or view the world differently, what they might think or need. People who physically navigate the world differently what they might think or need. How do we create a place where all can play, all can learn, all can make meaningful connections and experience a sense of belonging with one another, with community, and with greater in interconnections of life and love. And we could do those things and find that you know, we may say, well, if we do these things, that will bring more people through the door. After all, you know, some people say, if we build it, they will come. But sometimes, sometimes we build it and they don't come. And that's okay. Because we, we ourselves are better for having built it. And chances are, we already have people here who may need some of these things. We ourselves are better for having built it because we experience new and renewed invitation. We experience deeper connections and a fuller sense of belongingness. 
it's not easy. It takes time, and it takes intention, and it takes commitment. It means having a wide range of approaches and experiences, flexibility and the willingness to adapt and change, willingness to have difficult conversations and to try new things in a spirit of creativity and experimentation and knowing some things just aren't going to work, and that's okay. It's fun. It's challenging. It's hard work. It's good work. And it's heart work. Heart work. Spirit work. And spiritual work. The work of creating a clearing, of making space, of holding things gently in cupped hands. May it be so, and may we make it so. Amen, ashe, and blessed be. Thank you so much, Dave. Each week, as we worship, we welcome the offerings that support the work of the community. Many of us have already given our monetary gifts online or electronically, and still we set aside this time for the spiritual practice of gratitude. For those of you joining us online, you may make your offering in one of three ways, which are listed on the screen or posted in the chat. For those of you in the sanctuary, you may place your offering in the plate. If you are new to Tree of Life, please let this giving opportunity pass you by. Your presence here is your gift to us. Your generosity to Tree of Life is greatly appreciated. And as always, we give thanks for these gifts and for all of the gifts that you bring to Tree of Life. I think we're going to, oh. So one of our things uh, that's a little bit different today is our um, message has a part two on brokenness and repair. Um, and I invite us, to, if you, could you go back to the slide for just a moment? So for folks who aren't familiar, that type of bowl, that type of, of pottery is a, a Japanese art form um, called kintsugi. And it's uh, the art of putting broken pottery pieces back together and mending them, sometimes with gold, sometimes with silver, um, sometimes with other materials. But it's the idea that we embrace our flaws and imperfections rather than try to hide them. And that by embracing those flaws and imperfections, we can make an even more beautiful work of art, create a stronger bowl. Each break is unique. And so it teaches us an important lesson about ourselves. It's meant not only as an art form, but as a, as a lesson, a metaphor, uh, reminding us that sometimes in the process of repairing things that are broken, we actually create something 
more unique, more beautiful, and more resilient. For those of you that are familiar uh, with the UU uh, singer and musician um, Peter Mayer, he has a song um, called Japanese Bowls. And I uh, invite you to go look it up and listen to him uh, sing these words. But the lyrics are, I'm like one of those Japanese bowls that were made long ago. I have some cracks in me. They've been filled with gold. That's what they used back then when they had a bowl to mend. It did not hide the cracks. It made them shine instead. So now every old scar shows from every time I broke. And anyone's eyes can see that I'm not what I used to be. But in the collector's eyes, all these jagged lines make me more beautiful and worth a higher price. I'm like one of those Japanese bowls. I was made long ago, and I have some cracks that you can see. See how they shine of gold. One of the most beautiful reflections I think I've ever read or heard or come across um, in thinking about brokenness as just part of who we are, as part of our humanity, was actually written by Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is the lawyer and the activist who um, has worked for many years representing people who are on, on death row and trying to get their sentence um, commuted. Some who are innocent, some who aren't, but because he just believes that that is not our place to be putting people to death. Um, he has a, uh, uh, an organization called the Inkwell Justice Initiative, a book called Just Mercy, and in that book, he describes many of his cases, and one of these is the case of a, a young black man, um, Jimmy Dill, who's a young man with cognitive impairments. And um, Jimmy had gotten into a fight, um, and the person that he got into a fight with died many days later from medical complications, some of which was really connected with a lack of care and treatment that he was receiving. But Jimmy Dill's charge was changed from aggravated assault to murder, and he was sentenced to death. And Brian Stevenson tried as much as he could to try to get a stay of execution, and it's one of those cases where he was unsuccessful. And so in his book, he describes the heartbreaking phone call that he has to make uh, to Jimmy Dill and the conversation they had together, the things that they shared, and the ways that they cried together and let each other know that they each loved each other. And in the book, following that description, he writes this reflection. We are all broken by something. We all have hurt someone and have been hurt. We all share the condition of brokenness, even if our brokenness is not equivalent. I desperately wanted mercy for Jimmy Dill, and I would have done anything to create justice for him. But I couldn't pretend that his struggle was disconnected from my own. The ways in which I have been hurt and have hurt others are different from the ways Jimmy Dill suffered and caused suffering but our shared brokenness connected us. He writes, Paul Farmer, the renowned physician who has spent his life trying to cure the world's sickest and poorest people, once quoted me something that the writer Thomas Merton said. We are bodies of broken bones. I guess I'd always known but never fully considered that being broken is what makes us human. We all have our reasons. Sometimes we're fractured by the choices we make. Sometimes we're shattered by things we could never have chosen. But our brokenness is also the source of our common humanity. 
the basis for our shared search for comfort, meaning, and healing. Our shared vulnerability and imperfection nurtures and sustains our capacity for compassion. We have a choice. We can embrace our humanness, which means embracing our broken natures and the compassion that remains our best hope for healing. Or we can deny our brokenness, forswear compassion, and as a result, deny our humanity. We all have our brokenness, our ways that we've been hurt by someone, and we all have ways that we've hurt someone else, intentionally or unintentionally. And that doesn't magically end because we've joined a congregation. It doesn't magically end because we become Unitarian Universalist. Sometimes we experience brokenness here, in this place and in this community. And one of the ways that we learn to embrace this, one of the ways that we have built into our, our faith practice is this practice of covenant in creating these shared covenants, these shared promises of right, right relations in which we reflect and talk openly about how we will strive to be together in ways that are compassionate, in ways that we can support one another in creating safe, and brave spaces in ways that we can grow together and grow in spirit. And living into our covenant of right relations and creating new covenants takes ongoing practice and ongoing reflection and ongoing discussion and ongoing commitment, knowing at times that we're going to fall short. And in those times, it's important for us to be intentional about repair, about repairing covenant, about repairing relations if possible. And sometimes it's not possible. Repairing what has been broken and like a kintsugi bowl, transform our flaws and imperfections into something even more beautiful and more resilient. Your Tree of Life board our newly formed Committee on Ministry and I are all committed to renewal of this heart, heart work and this spirit work around covenant, right relations, healthy congregational communication, and covenant repair with all of us together in the church year ahead as an essential part of our shared ministry. Throughout the summer, there's been a small group of us who've been working on ways to ensure safe and healthy boundaries within our congregation. Leah's been part of that work. Sue's been part of that work. Our Committee on Ministry has been part of our work. And some of that's included individual conversations and follow-up, and some of that's included board work and training around right relations and responses to instances of harm. And we're in process of reviewing relevant policies and procedures, including developing a grievance policy, and most importantly, working towards rejuvenating and renewing our right relations and healthy communications team and training and practices. That's work that's ongoing. And so while we're rebuilding that right relations team, please remember and please do not hesitate to reach out to me um, as needed for assistance, for discussion, for reflection as part of our community of care, as part of our shared pastoral care. And so we practice the art of kintsugi, the humanity and beauty of brokenness and repair and our congregation and our community is a kintsugi bowl, beautiful, unique, and resilient. <laughs>